That was a wonderful talk. We very much appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Roberts said we might stretch a little as he walks on the way down here. I believe there's chairs at the front for our people in the dietary focus groups who are joining us at this time. Uh, while you're stretching, uh, I think Dr. Bill Roberts needs no introduction. The editor of the American Journal of Cardiology and the executive director of the Baylor Cardiovascular Institute. He's got a wonderful talk for us which will conclude our program. Uh, prior to our reception, which I hope you will all stay and join us in and be very nice after this. Bill, are you here? Where are you? Here we go. After you stretched a bit, we'll get started and try to keep somewhat on time. Thank you. Thank you. Wilson, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Go ahead with the first slide. This is going to have to do with uh, lipids. Uh, and this is a coronary artery. I had to go to another country to find a coronary artery in an adult that looked this good. Uh, this is really, truly the, the best coronary artery I've ever seen in an adult. Uh, and we don't see these uh, in the USA, uh, I'm afraid, very much. Uh, if you just look at that person next to you, one of you gonna die and with arteries that look like this. Now, I know it's the other one, not you, but nearly 50% of our population in this nation, progressive nation, a die from atherosclerosis. And the sad thing is that atherosclerosis is clearly hereditary in one out of 500 people. Some argue, well, that should be one out of 200. But the point is, is that 199 out of 200 or 499 out of 500, we determine whether our arteries look like this or whether they look like that first picture. Now, atherosclerosis, not only is it a problem of uh, mortality and morbidity and so on, these are the numbers of deaths in this country from heart disease in the USA. And we're talking about nearly, nearly a million people every year among our population of 260 million people. Coronary disease, by far the most, uh, most important, most frequent, are uh, nearly half a million people. And this is a very sad thing as far as I'm concerned. This has to do with acute myocardial infarction, that is heart attacks uh, in the USA. Uh, what we see here, the yellow represents men and the red represents women. And this is the uh, estimated annual number of heart attacks in the USA. Look at this in young in men age 45 to 64. Heart attacks are as common in that age group as in the age group after 65. The average age of death in men from coronary disease in this country is 6-0. This, a, a, this is not a disease uh, of old people. 6-0, as far as I'm concerned, is the, is the ultimate. That's the prime of, prime of life, and, and so many of the men just don't, don't make it. And look, ladies, uh, you're as, uh, as frequent as men uh, after age 65. The average age of death in women is 68. Your, ch your, your chances of dying of atherosclerosis is one out of two. Your chances of dying of cancer of the breast is one out of nine. Uh, this uh, disease, namely atherosclerosis, uh, not only affects the coronary arteries, that is those which supply our heart muscle with blood, but they affect the arteries in our neck, those in our head, those in our abdomen, and those in our legs and arms. And each year, look at this, coronary angioplasty, we're, we're over 400,000 now per year. Coronary bypass, we're approaching 470,000 per year. Uh, carotid uh, endarterectomy, a good operation, we're approaching uh, nearly 110,000, peripheral bypass operations, 72,000, abdominal aneurysms, 33,000, uh, uh, cardiac catheterizations, uh, over a million per uh, year, total open heart operations, uh, nearly 600,000. We're talking about procedures and diagnostic therapeutic affecting three million people in this country per year. And this is not a hereditary uh, condition. When we pull our chair up to that table uh, 21 times a week, we're determining whether we're gonna get on this list or not. Now this is also a very costly disease, as you well know. This is uh, 
estimated cost for 1995, and here's total cardiovascular disease. Now that uh, 138 billion, billion dollars, there are a lot of zeros uh, in a billion, as you recall, and the yellow here represents hospital costs. Uh, hospital costs by far is the major expense uh, of medical care. Drugs, shown in red here, is relatively small in comparison to hospital costs, and physician costs, shown in green, are relatively uh, small uh, compared to hospital costs. I, I, let me uh, try to answer six questions in the rest of this presentation. Question one, how much atherosclerosis is needed in the coronary arteries to cause myocardial ischemia? Well, the answer to that depends on what uh, method of examination uh, one uses. Let me show you how much narrowing is needed in order to cause death from atherosclerosis. And in my view, the, uh, the approximately same amount of narrowing is present in patients with symptomatic myocardial ischemia as it is in fatal myocardial ischemia. What is shown here are the three major coronary arteries which supply our heart muscle with blood in patients with fatal acute myocardial infarction, death of heart muscle. Uh, if you take these arteries and divide them into little bitty five millimeter segments, we come up with approximately 55 segments per person. And if we ask the question, how many of those segments, and I'm talking about cross-sectional area narrowing here, not diameter reduction, which is the unit of angiography, what percent of those segments in a large group of patients are narrowed 76 to 100 percent in cross-sectional area? That is, if you have a circle divided into four quadrants, how many of those quadrants, uh, how many of those segments have over three quadrants obliterated? And the answer to that question is about a third, about a third. The total lengths of these coronary arteries is about like that. That means about a third of them are severely narrowed. And then another third is narrowed 51 to 75 percent in cross-sectional area, and only about 5 to 8 percent of these segments are narrowed less than 25 percent in cross-sectional area, and not a single segment is totally normal. I think this is important when one is looking at angiograms because one is comparing an area of severe narrowing to an adjacent area which is simply less narrowed. Now if we look at this another way and ask the question, what, uh, that, what is the uh, uh, space through which blood flows in our major coronary arteries in a 21-year-old? And let's assume for the minute that that 20-year-old has no plaques in those arteries. And I would suggest to you that that lumen size is this. Now, at age 60, in a patient with fatal coronary disease, it turns out that about 65% or 67% of that lumen is obliterated by plaque. So the person was previously living on about a third of the lumen. We had control studies for these patients and only about a third of the lumen was obliterated. So the answer to the question, uh, how much narrowing is present in these coronary arteries in patients with fatal, and I believe, symptomatic myocardial ischemia, the answer is a whole lot. That's both good news and bad news. The good news is, is that we have to have an awful lot of plaque before we get in trouble. The bad news is that despite the fact we have to have a lot, we go ahead and we get a lot. <laughs> Question two, what do atherosclerotic plaques consist of? When I ask that question to audiences, or whether it's cardiologists, whether it's lay public, it, the answer is always the same, fat, cholesterol. The answer, however, is fibrous tissue. Now, I'm not asking the question, what do atherosclerotic plaques consist of in 10-year-old children or 20-year-old young men? I'm asking, what do these plaques consist of in the coronary arteries in patients with fatal coronary artery disease? Now, what is shown in this complicated slide here are, are bar graphs and the little five millimeter segments, which were now 25% or less, were put in this column. And those little segments, which had virtual total occlusion of the artery, 96 to 100%, were put in this column. 
And all of these patients were over 40 years of age. The average age was 60, and these were all men in this particular study. And what this slide shows, uh, that the plaques predominantly consist of fibrous tissue be it acellular or dense fibrous tissue, or be it the red uh, cellular fibrous tissue. Uh, calcium, shown here in blue, was present only in the large plaques. The green represents pultaceous debris. I love that phrase, pultaceous debris. That means extracellular lipid. Interestingly, that's only in the larger plaques. And foam cells, shown in dark, were very uncommon in these uh, big plaques. Uh, now, we're in the era of reversibility of plaques. Which por portions of these things are reversible? Well, clearly, the pultation, the extracellular lipid is reversible. The foam cell material is clearly reversible. Now, the dense scar tissue is not, almost certainly. There's some evidence that maybe some of that cellular fibrous tissue is reversible. So the answer to the question, what do atherosclerotic plaques consist of, at least in patients with fatal coronary disease, the answer is scar tissue. There's a lot of relationship, a lot of research going on now between the relationship between lipids and clotting. Is it that possibly the lipids working, work by turning on the clotting process? And what we're seeing is the end result of a clotting process rather than the end result of lipid deposition and the lipids work uh, in another way. Question three, how many direct atherosclerotic risk factors exist? Now, of course, the key word there is direct, and how would you define that? I would define that is, what risk factors do you have to have before you get atherosclerosis? Do you have to be hypertensive? Do you have to smoke cigarettes? Do you have to have diabetes? Do you have to be obese? No. You have to have hypercholesterolemia. Now, how would one define that? I would define that as a total cholesterol greater than 150 milligrams per deciliter. Now, you might say, well, I, nobody walks in my office with a level that, uh, uh, that uh, low um, or high, but uh, that's true. In the USA, only 5% of Americans over age 40 have a total cholesterol under 150. But if you're a pure vegetarian, your total cholesterol is more liable to be about 135 or 140. And if it is about 140, you don't form atherosclerotic plaques. And if you have a total cholesterol of 280 and you get it down to 140, you won't form any more atherosclerotic plaques. So we can prevent this process and we can, even if it's there, we can prevent it from getting any worse. Now, I'm not saying hypertension is not important. We have 60 million Americans with high blood pressure, and if you want to prevent a stroke, keep that blood pressure down. And you can't be healthy and smoke cigarettes. For every cigarette you smoke, you increase your chances of cancer and, and chronic lung disease enormously. If you, have, if you smoke 20 cigarettes a day, your chances of cancer lung are 20 times that of the person who smokes no cigarettes. And the, this cigarette smoking is costing us billions of dollars, and the non-smoker is paying at li probably as much as 50% of the bill from, uh, from the cigarette smokers. So I'm a cholesterol person. What factors indicate that cholesterol causes atherosclerosis. And the point here is, is that if your blood pressure, if your total cholesterol is 135, your blood pressure can be 300 over 150, and you will not form an atherosclerotic plaque. If your total cholesterol is 135 and you smoke 40 cigarettes a day, you won't form an atherosclerotic plaque. But if your total cholesterol is over 150 and you do these other things, you're in serious trouble. Uh, what factors indicate that cholesterol causes atherosclerosis? Well, there are at least six. Uh, this started uh, by the Russians in 1908. Uh, they fed some non-human animals, and which ones did they pick? They picked rabbits, folks. You can only produce atherosclerosis in an herbivore. You can give your dog a cat all the cholesterol, all the fat you want. You can't produce an atherosclerotic plaque. So they picked rabbits, and they produced atherosclerotic plaques, the same as those in humans. The interesting thing about all this cholesterol stuff 
is that items four, five, and six were solidified the last decade. The higher the blood total cholesterol level, the greater the chance of having symptomatic atherosclerotic disease, the greater the chance of dying from it, and the greater the extent of the atherosclerotic plaques. Lowering blood uh, total cholesterol level, and specifically the LDL cholesterol level, that's the bad one, decreases the chances of fatal and non-fatal atherosclerotic disease, and atherosclerotic plaques regress, or at least they have that potential, when high levels are lowered. Now this is a slide which shows uh, the magnitude of total cholesterol levels in the USA. That is those over 240. Now that is an awfully high number. In the USA today, in adults aged 20 to 75, the average total cholesterol is about 215. But that is too high. But this is way too high. Over 240 mill milligrams per deciliter. Look at this, uh, ladies. After age 60, uh, nearly, whether you're white or whether you're black, about 43% of the U.S. population of women after age 60 have total cholesterols greater than 240. Uh, and look at here, men. Uh, men go to pot between age 30 and 40. Uh, it, it's a disastrous decade. I have a son in that decade, and I've just seen him expand, unfortunately. Uh, but that is an awful period uh, for men, particularly. Uh, now, this is a, uh, a famous uh, seven nation study. Ansel Keys and his colleagues went to these seven nations. They studied over 13,000 people. And each of those individuals, they searched for symptomatic coronary artery heart disease, and they found it very infrequently in countries like Japan and Greece, and they found it devastatingly frequent in the USA and Finland. And what did Ansel Keys conclude from those studies done in the 1960s? Uh, in southern Japan at that period of time, only 10% of their calories were coming from fat. Now they're up to 23%. They're trying to catch up with us. But at that time, uh, their total cholesterol averaged only 150, and it was a very narrow curve. In Finland, East Finland, the, the, about 45% uh, of their calories were coming from fat, and their total cholesterol was approaching 300. This is a study which I think is a wonderful one. This was published in 1986. It involved over 350,000 people. All men, sorry, ladies, aged 35 to 57 when they entered the study. None of those men had any evidence of heart disease. They were divided into 10 groups according to their serum total cholesterol level. And what we see here, as that level goes up, 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 and up, the coronary artery disease mortality, and this is only a six-year mortality. It's higher at 10 years, it's higher at 12 years, it's higher at 15, goes up, up, up. No study shows it better in my view that that total cholesterol, and specifically the LDL cholesterol, is a quantity, and the higher that quantity, the greater the risk. Uh, this slide is based on the two primary prevention studies. Primary prevention, of course, means that the group of patients being studied have no evidence of heart disease when they enter the study. Uh, these studies are extremely expensive to perform, and the results of those studies are very clear. Uh, if one compares the group of people who took the lipid-lowering agent to those who did not, this is what happens. Uh, when you lower your total cholesterol about 10%, and let's say you start at 200, if you bring it down to 180, you decrease your chance of a heart attack by 30%. In other words, for every 1% reduction in that total cholesterol, you get a 3% reduction in heart attack risk. Now, that's the kind of company I want to invest in. Now, the reverse, unfortunately, is true. If you, lower, if you raise your total cholesterol by 10%, you increase your chance of a heart attack by 30 percent. Uh, this slide uh, has to do with secondary prevention. Now secondary prevention means that the group of, of people being studied have already had a heart attack or they've already had a peripheral vascular ischemic event or they already have a narrowed coronary uh, carotid arteries or coronary arteries. And this is an angiographic slide here and it has to do with regression meaning these plaques shrink 
or progression, meaning the plaques get bigger. And all of the, and half of the patients in these studies uh, were treated with a lipid lowering agent or some type of diet or a partial ileal bypass operation, some type of procedure which lowers the total and LDL cholesterol level. And all of these studies, except the first one, and there were some uh, unique problems here, all show the same thing. And that is, if you take a group of people who've already had a heart attack and put them on a cholesterol-lowering regime, uh, that there will be evidence of regression in those treated during one year, two years, two and a half years, four years, or further. Every one of these show that the treatment group benefited. And furthermore, progression means the plaques got bigger. Every one of the studies show that the treatment group had less progression than the non-treatment group. Now, how many patients are having this kind of data acted upon? And the answer is relatively few. This is even more important. Who cares whether the plaques get bigger or smaller? It's how we feel. It's whether or not we can survive. And the, this uh, event reduction means that, that if you've had one heart attack, what are your chances of having a second heart attack in a specified period of time compared to the control group? And those treated on lipid-lowering therapy, look at this kind of reduction, a 35% reduction in subsequent heart attack during this time period, a 80% reduction, and these with little asterisks here, these are significant, 69% reduction, 89% reduction, 39% reduction. Now, we've all heard that if you've had a heart attack, you better get on that aspirin tablet and stay on it. What does that do? It reduces subsequent heart attack by about 25%. We're talking here 89%. Beta blocker, we heard a lot about beta blockers. They're very good after a heart attack. It reduces subsequent uh, events by 25%. This reduces it up to nearly 90%. And this is the last drug thought of. Uh, now, how does it work? How does regression work? Well, nobody knows for sure. You can only do an autopsy once, so we don't have a, uh, a thing to study. But let's say we have a coronary artery and it's narrowed over 75% in cross-sectional area. And the physiologists have taught us that unless an artery, a tube, a pipe is narrowed over 75%, there's no reduction in flow through it. So if we can get this lipid out of there, and lower it down to this point, we can open that lumen up theoretically so that it is, that it is narrowed less than 75%, and if so, flow through there should be as if there was no plaque at all. The point is, is that relatively small reductions in plaque mass can be transferred into very large increases in lumen size. Now this is the 4S study. We heard from, uh, from Dr. Rutherford a, a bit about the 4S study and how good it is, and that's, there's no question, uh, this is one of the best lipid-lowering studies uh, that, that's come across. Four means the number of patients studied was 4444, 4,444. S means that these studies took place in the five Scandinavian uh, countries. Uh, the studies were continued until 444 people had died, and that took five and a half years. But look at the benefit. Now, half of these patients were put on simvastatin, which is Zocor, either 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams. There was a 30% overall reduction in, in, uh, in risk. Now, I forgot to mention that 80% of these people had had a heart attack. The 80% had had acute myocardial infarction and it healed and they were alive. 20% had angina pectoris. So they all had had a coronary event before they were entered into the study. An overall death, and this was in, within five and a half years, 30% reduction. Risk of, an, of coronary death decreased 42%. Risk of a major coronary event, which was non-fatal, decreased 34%. Look at this. I see some surgeons in the audience. My son is, is, uh, has one more year in training in cardiovascular surgery. So, so I, I, I look at this with uh, some glaring eyes. There was 37% reduction in need for angioplasty 
or coronary bypass operation, a 37% reduction. Now, let me tell you that in the five Scandinavia, Scandinavian countries where this study was done, relatively few people uh, have an angioplasty or a bypass operation. You've got to be on your last breath before they do those procedures over here. So this, this could be in this country maybe twice then. So we have to be aware of this. Uh, Event-free survival increased 26%. Look at the reductions, LDL cholesterol, 38% reduction. HDL went up 8%. Total cholesterol went down 28%. Folks, within five years, maybe four years, there will be cholesterol-lowering agents out there that will lower total cholesterol by 60%. 60%. It's around the corner. And look at these p-values. There are four zeros before the number out here. That means that these things like a reduction in total mortality, coronary mortality, major coronary events, need for these procedures, event-free survival, were highly, highly significant. Also, it paid dividends from the standpoint of saving money. Uh, these are the effects of simvastatin and the need for hospitalization in these procedures uh, in the placebo group compared to the simvastatin group. Hospitalization for acute myocardial infarction, prolonged chest pain, or left ventricular failure decreased 33% uh, uh, those on the treatment group. Total cardiovascular uh, hospitalizations decreased 26%. Total days in the hospital, an interesting way to look at it. 15,000 plus or minus here, 10,000 here, a 34% reduction. Uh, mean days in the hospital for these various procedures, marked reductions. Uh, now, how does the cholesterol lowering from a cost standpoint compare to these other procedures? I've heard a lot of people say, my patients can't afford these drugs. They cost too much. Cost too much compared to what? Compared to, to bypass, to, to pacemakers, uh, to some of these, to uh, heart transplantation, hemodialysis, drugs over the entire schema of things in medical care are relatively inexpensive. Now, the, the, uh, I've mentioned the 4S study. Uh, Provostatin is another one of these statin drugs. I don't think there's much difference in these four statin drugs. Uh, I think the important thing is to get patients on them. Uh, which one one chooses, I don't think makes much difference. But there have been four studies recently with, uh, with Provostatin and they, they show similar results. Significant reduction in the atherosclerotic progression in all four studies. Clinical event reductions observed within one year. Meta-analysis of approximately 2,000 patients showed uh, uh, marked reductions in uh, clinical coronary events, et cetera. Uh, this is from the Provostatin group. Uh, the proportion of subjects uh, uh, with events uh, during a three-year period was markedly reduced by this statin drug. Uh, the uh, coronary event and all cause mortality also markedly reduced, just like the 4S study. And the, uh, uh, another one of these studies on total events, that was a question at one time, markedly reduced. Question five, how can symptomatic atherosclerosis be prevented? And if present, how can it be arrested? Anybody. What's that? What are we trying to do? Well, in my view, if your total cholesterol is 150 or lower, our challenge is to keep it there. If it's above that, our challenge is to bring it down. Now, how can a normal cholesterol level be prevented from rising, and how can elevated levels be lowered to normal? Now, that's the rub. That's what we all uh, want. Uh, well, we got to do three things, folks, and none of them are much fun. We've got to decrease the amount of cholesterol we take in every day, we've got to decrease the amount of fat we take in every day, and we've got to decrease the total calories we take in every day. This shows how cholesterol works. Uh, these, each of one of these lines represent three different groups of investigators, and they all show the same thing, and that is, if you take a group of people and you increase their cholesterol intake, the cholesterol level in the blood will go up. Now, it doesn't work perfectly with each person. One person can eat three eggs and the total cholesterol will shoot up. Another person can eat three eggs and it won't change at all. So there is individual variability here. But in groups of people, the more cholesterol we take in, the higher our cholesterol level. 
But folks, I don't really worry too much about that cholesterol uh, as far as the amount we take in every day because we take in a relatively small quantity, 400 milligrams or 500 milligrams every day. And as you know, all cholesterol that we take in comes from animals or, or their, and their products. So if we give up animals, eating them anyway, and their products, uh, we, we, we have eliminated uh, that source of cholesterol. About half of it comes from eggs we take in, the visible and non-visible ones, and then about 30% nearly comes from uh, bovine muscle, we nicely call it beef. Uh, but if you add up all of the, the contributions of the cows, you know, here's 28% and here's 9% and here's 4%, uh, it, it adds up to a lot. Now, how do, you pick, how do you think about 500 milligrams? Well, I can tell you that a toothpick weighs 100 milligrams. So we take in the equivalent of five toothpicks every day, and we can eliminate two of those toothpicks by eggs alone. Now, the real villain, in my view, is this word, three-letter word here called fat. And unfortunately, in the USA, we take in more of this than any body of human beings on planet Earth. Uh, I saw recently that the average in the U.S. is about 140 grams of fat every day. Now, how do you picture 140 grams? I can tell you that a deck of cards weighs 75 grams. So many of us in this country take in as much as the equivalent of two decks of cards of fat every day. And the problem with the fat is about a third of it is saturated. Now, let's say we take in 120 grams of fat. That means that about 40 grams of that is saturated, and when that saturated fat enters our bodies, it's essentially converted into cholesterol. So our biggest source of fat, uh, actually, of cholesterol, actually comes through the fat cycle. Now, all of these fats we, and oils we take in every day have all three components in them, saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated. Now, the mono and the poly have a neutral effect on our total and LDL cholesterol levels, or they lower them. Now, the saturated, they shoot them up. Now, we've got to avoid these over here in this column. Look at coconut oil. That's the worst thing almost we can put in our mouths. 92% saturated fat, 86% palm kernel oil, butter fat, 66%, beef tallow, 52%. Scott Grundy in this city has some evidence that maybe monounsaturated Fats are better for us than polyunsaturated. Look at olive oil. Whoa, 77% monounsaturated. Those Greeks and Italians, they know what they're doing over there. Peanut oil is 48% monounsaturated. Now, folks, if you want to get a good grease job quickly, there's no better place to do it uh, than, the, uh, than the fast food chain. Uh, uh, these are uh, some of the ingredients of the hamburgers sold at uh, some of these fast food chains. Now, the champ today is Clark Jr. Double Western Bacon Cheeseburger. <laughs> Folks, that's the coronary artery bypass special. <laughs> it, it's closely followed by Jack in the Box Ultimate Cheeseburger. We're talking about a thousand calories in that single hamburger. And if you take that sucker and squeeze it real hard, you can come up with about 15 <laughs> teaspoons of that. And I assure you that that's a, that's greatly saturated. Now, sodium, we heard from uh, Dr. Rutherford that none of us should take in over about 2,300 milligrams of sodium every day. You can get 18 of them right there with that one hamburger. <laughs> and probably we shouldn't take in more than that. I'll have the half pound double deluxe bacon steer burger, please. You want chemotherapy with that? <laughs> This fellow, Hall, wrote an interesting book. He asked the question, what do we consume in the USA every 24 hours? Well, we consume about 815 billion calories of food, roughly 200 billion more than we need. Those 200 billion left over would feed the whole country of Mexico uh, every day. When I was at NIH until two years ago, we had a lot of foreign visitors there, and every time one would walk into my office, I would always ask, what strikes you most about Americans? Now, of course, that produced, produced a lot of different answers, but answer number one is how many fat people we have in the U.S. In 1960, we reached 60%. Three out of every five Americans are overweight. 
Nearly 100,000 cattle are slaughtered every day, yielding 60 million pounds of red meat. As you know, in this nation, we have 260 million people, and we have 100 million cows. And we kill about 100,000 of them every day, 1,100 pounds uh, hanging up there. And we do it differently, as you know, in the USA and Canada than in the rest of the country, the rest of the world. We bring them into these feedlots the last five to six months of life, and there we feed them 20, 25 pounds of, of grains and soybeans. And why do we do that? We do that, of course, to make them fat. And why do we want them fat? Because they taste better. And then we kill them, and then they kill us. And that's the way it works. Now, we also kill about 250,000 hogs every day and eat about 4 million pounds of bacon. Bacon is really the pits. It's about 85% pure fat. If you got a couple of eggs on your plate and, and two strips of bacon, I'd prefer the eggs over that bacon. Now, if you don't know what it is, make a hot dog out of it, and we eat about 47 million of them every day in this nation. Dairy cows yield about 47 million gallons of milk. We eat 170 million eggs every day. And folks, if you're a chicken, don't wander into the USA because uh, we kill at least 12 million chickens every day. I saw a while back that number's maybe up to 19 million. We eat about 50 million pounds of sugar, an average of 21 teaspoons apiece every day. Can you imagine waking up in the morning, looking at your bedside table, and seeing 21 teaspoons of sugar there? Uh, this, these processed foods we all eat are loaded with sugar and they're loaded with salt. We also eat about 3 million gallons of ice cream and 10 million pounds of candy every day. We drank 16 million gallons of beer and ale and 1.5 million gallons of hard liquor every day, enough to make 26 million Americans thoroughly drunk every day. We still uh, have uh, 40 five or 47 million cigarette smokers in the USA. They smoke about 85 million packs of cigarettes. 3,000 to 4,000 teenagers start smoking every day in this nation. I like this statement by William Collins. A carnival animal has almost an unlimited capacity to handle saturated fats and cholesterol, whereas a vegetarian and herbivorous animals have a very restricted capacity to handle these food components. It is virtually impossible to produce atherosclerosis in the dog, even when 100 grams of cholesterol, now that's 200 times the average daily intake for humans in the USA, plus 120 grams of butter fat are added to its meat ration. In contrast, adding only two grams of cholesterol daily to a rabbit's chow for two months produces striking fatty changes in its arterial wall. Now, are we more like the rabbit or more like the dog? Now, let's examine that a little closer. Here we have some characteristics of carnivores and herbivores. Now, when you look down at your appendages, do you see claws? Or do you see these hands we're supposed to be using for gathering these fruits and vegetables? Now, some argue that, yeah, these teeth in front of our mouth, they're sharp, so we're really omnivores, but most of our teeth are flat for grinding those fruits and vegetables. Now, the intestinal tract of a, of a dog or cat, of course, is very short. You give them something to eat, they gotta go outside in a few minutes and do their thing. But the intestinal tract of a human being, I mean, the small intestine alone will go from right to here all the way to that wall over there. Plenty of time to extract these nutrients. Now, when you cool your body, do you pant like a dog or do you sweat? When you drink water, you lap it like your cat or do you sip it? Now, I don't know any, any human beings that make their own vitamin C. Carnivores make their own vitamin C. Folks, I think we think we're one of these carnivores and we certainly conduct our lives as if we were, but I would suggest, as have many others, that basically, fundamentally, this is the group we're in. Now, there are some uh, interesting studies on pure vegetarians. And if we could take us in this room and put the few pure vegetarians against that wall and the rest of us against this wall over here and ask a simple question, what diseases do those pure vegetarians over there not get that the meat eaters over here get? Well, they're not bothered by atherosclerosis. It's gonna kill one half of us in this room. They're not bothered by high blood pressure. We have 60 million Americans with high blood pressure. And as you know, uh, blood pressure when we're born is 90 over 60. In societies where they eat no salt, zero salt, there are very few of them, but there are a few, they have, their blood pressure throughout life is 90 over 60, 90 over 60 at 40, 90 over 60 at 60, 90 over 60 uh, at uh, 
at 80, etc. We call in this country blood pressure 138 over 88 normal. Incidentally, that's the most common blood pressure in an airline pilot. If it gets 140 over 90, they're grounded. So just keep, keep taking it till it gets down to 138 over 88. Uh, now, the pure vegetarians, there are certain cancers that are infrequent. We've heard about genetic uh, things with uh, cancer of the breast, but that's 3 or 5% of, of that population. Uh, cancer of the colon, two of the three most common cancers, very uncommon in pure vegetarians. I saw an article recently that uh, heavy meat eaters have a much higher frequency of cancer of the prostate gland than light meat eaters. Diabetes mellitus after age 50 uh, is very uncommon in pure vegetarians. They're not obese, they're not bothered by peptic ulcer, constipation, hemorrhoids, diverticulosis, appendicitis, irritable bowel syndrome, high hernia. They don't get stones in the gallbladder, stones in the kidney. Look at this, ladies, osteoporosis. Why osteoporosis is more common in women than men, I do not know, but it's estimated that by age 65, ladies, you will have lost 35% of your skeleton. Why? Because you're not taking enough calcium? No, almost surely because we're taking in too much protein. The more protein we take in, the more calcium we lose. And osteoarthritis, a major problem in this nation, uh, uncommon in pure vegetarians. This slide came from World War II, as you know, 1939 to 1945. And as you know, in certain countries during that period of time, there was not much butter and there was not much cheese and there was not much milk and there was not much meat to eat. And what happened to the cardiovascular death rate? Well, in Sweden, boom, it fell. In Finland, boom, it fell. In Norway, boom, it fell. In the USA, it just kept on going up. Can we change our health? Of course we can. Uh, this slide came from the Harvard School of Public Health. It summarizes 20 studies on the relationship between body weight, shown on the horizontal axis here, and what they call mortality ratio, which simply means when we die. And what this shows, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, the more we weigh, the sooner we die. Now, we can all point out the Winston Churchills, but in groups of people, the more we weigh, the sooner we die. Um, this has to do with overweightness in the USA. Look at this. Black women in this nation, about 45% uh, age 20 to 74 are overweight. This is a major health problem in this country. But the rest of us, about 25%, are over 20% greater than ideal body weight. Now, greater than 20%, that's a lot of weight, folks. That's a lot. <coughs> Uh, this slide has to do with cancer of the breast. Why, why is he talking about cancer of the breast? On the horizontal axis here is the fat consumed by adults in these various nations around the world. And on the vertical axis is the frequency, the death rate from cancer of the breast. Here we are, USA, right there. We're taking in over 140 grams of fat per day. And we have one of the highest frequencies of cancer of the breast in the world. Now, this could also be cancer of the colon. The lower the quantity of fat consumed by any society, the lower the frequency of cancer of the colon. We're talking about two of our three most common cancers. And of course, it could be systemic hypertension, high blood pressure. The lower the quantity of fat consumed by any society, the lower the blood pressure. And of course, it could be atherosclerosis. The lower the quantity of fat consumed by any society, the lower the frequency of atherosclerosis. We're talking about our two of the three most common cancers and two of the two most common cardiovascular conditions. The most common prescribed diet by physicians in the USA is a 30% of calories from fat. The average American is taking in about 38, 39, or 40% of calories from fat every day. Now, if you reduce that from, let's say, 40%, roughly, down to 30%, what does that do to the total cholesterol level? What does that do to the LDL cholesterol level? This is the most commonly prescribed diet in the USA. Let's try this patient on diet first, and then if it doesn't work, we'll go to drugs. Well, the average reduction in total cholesterol by a 25% reduction in percent of calories from fat is a 5% reduction in total cholesterol and a 5% reduction in LDL. We're kidding ourselves. If you're going to have benefit from a diet, we've got to get that percent of calories from fat down to about 20%. And then we get a 20% reduction, approximately, in both total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Now, the unusual thing about all this is the average is a 5% reduction. 
But when you're looking at that single patient, you can't predict it. Some people get a 30% reduction in total cholesterol by that diet. And in other people, the total cholesterol goes up 20%. So in a single patient, you can't predict. In a group of people, it's only a 5% reduction. Now drugs, I think these statin drugs are really, really the way to go. Um, bile acid resins, uh, I don't want to spend the last 10 years of my life taking 30,000 milligrams of a bile acid resin three times a day. It just, and get constipated and all, all the rest. And they are expensive. And they increase the triglyceride and they have relatively little effect on the HDL. Uh, nicotinic acid is a wonderful drug. I think of nicotinic acid as a poor person's uh, 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 statin uh, drug. It, it has beneficial effects on all the four lipoproteins. I know someone in California takes 12 grams of nicotinic acid every day. On the average, however, if you start 100 people on nicotinic acid after one year, only, uh, 50, only uh, uh, a very small percent are still on that drug. Um, the, uh, a lot of the HMOs are trying to get people on 1.5 grams of nicotinic acid a day, taking it uh, twice a day, maybe three times a day. If one can afford the statin drugs, in my view, this is the way to go. It's once a day, you take it at supper time at night, you can take one pill or two pills. Uh, if you're looking for L LDL reduction, uh, the cost of all of these, uh, the cost of all these, here, the cost of all these drugs is essentially the same. One is stronger than another. Simvastatin, for example, is four times stronger than uh, fluvastatin. Alovastatin and pravastatin have a, a equivalent uh, uh, potency. Now, if you look at all the people in this nation who have symptomatic myocardial ischemia, nobody knows exactly what that number is. It's been estimated anywhere from 5.5 to 7.5 million people. Let's say it's 6 million people. Uh, it is known that only about 25% of people who have had atherosclerotic events, and these are just carnage. I'm not talking about abdominal aortic aneurysm or peripheral vascular disease or carotid arterial narrowing. Only about 25% of those people are uh, on a liquid lowering drug. And in my view, 100% should be on it. And when the patient with a heart attack comes to the accident room, in my view, when, they, the, when that aspirin tablet's put in their mouth, you ought to put a lipid lowering uh, agent in their mouth at the same time, or if not, it will be neglected. Uh, every one of these patients, in my view, who've had an atherosclerotic event should be started on a lipid lowering drug and work in diet with time, irrespective of what the level is, because whatever the level is in that particular patient, it's too high or they wouldn't be there. One of the problem, problems with these lipid lowering drugs is that, is that even when patients start on them, they don't stay on them. Uh, this is a, a, a slide that was, uh, shows some data uh, from a marketing uh, source. Uh, and it, it shows that within a year, only about half of the people started on a lipid lowering drug are still on it. And within two years, only about 25 uh, percent, and after two years, only about 15 percent. So just getting somebody on it initially is not enough. One has to just keep kicking them in the shins and making sure they stay on that drug because it's the best thing they can do after an atherosclerotic event. Now this is a, what, what happened to this coronary artery? What happened? What? Aneuplasm. Angioplasty, that's right. Balloon went off right here. Boom, cracked that plaque, little dissection. I think that occurs in every one of them, but that's good. Opens up a little more area for blood to flow through. My point of showing this is that angioplasty doesn't take the plaque away. Uh, that person needs lipid lowering therapy. Now you can argue, well, the lipid lowering therapy will not prevent restenosis. Of course it won't. Restenosis uh, re is a problem of a cut. You tear your arm, it's going to heal. But it does prevent uh, new plaque formation in other areas of the carnal tree if the total cholesterol can be brought down to the 150 arena. Indeed, if the total cholesterol can be brought down to the 130, 140, 150 milligram per deciliter arena, there is no evidence that new plaques form. What's this? That's a saphenous vein. 
And in the last five years of this patient's life, that saphenous vein was not down there in the leg. It was in the aortic coronary position. And here we are five years later, and it's filled up with atherosclerotic plaques. I think bypass operation is a great operation. I think angioplasty is a wonderful procedure. But in and of themselves, they're not enough. The lipid levels have to be brought down, and if you want to prevent these things filling up again, they need to be brought down to the 150 uh, arena. This is probably the best slide I can show. Uh, this is the lipid levels on the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. This is a relative risk of developing an atherosclerotic event. This line means that the person has never had uh, an atherosclerotic event before, and if you've had one, it shifts that line to the left. But irrespective of where you start on the line, if the cholesterol level can be lowered, the patient benefits enormously. For example, if we start at 310 here and the person's never had a heart attack before, if you knock it from 310 to 270, you knock that risk of developing an atherosclerotic event in half. If you knock it from 270 to 230, you knock it in half again. If you knock it from 230 to 190, you bring it down to average risk. Now, average risk is still too high but at least it pays. Now, if you've had a heart attack, it shifts it to the left, so now we start at 270. If you bring it to 230, you knock that risk of a subsequent heart attack in half. If you bring it from 230 down to 190, knock it in half again, 190 to so on. Big dividends, that's the kind of company I want to invest in. If we look just at the 4S data and apply it to population in the USA, uh, statin would, and I think any statin drug, there's nothing magical about simvastatin. Uh, simvastatin would prevent four of nine expected coronary deaths in a 5.5 year period. Simvastatin would prevent seven of 21 expected non-fatal heart attacks in a 5.5 year period. And simvastatin would prevent six of nine expected bypass operations or angioplasties in a five and a half year period. Now tell me, if a patient has a heart attack, should they be on one of these drugs? Folks, this is going to the courts. This is going to the courts. It's too strong. The data is too strong. We better act on it. Now these are coronary arteries in a patient who was 103 years of age. 103. These are coronary arteries at sites of maximal narrowing. This was a left main. I'll trade with her right now. This or right, that's the biggest plaque in the body, right? That's a left anterior descendant. Beautiful, 103 years of age. The reason I show it is to point out that atherosclerosis is not a degenerative disease. We are the degenerates. Uh, <laughs> this poor lady, 103, she was run over by an automobile. <laughs> I like Mark Twain's statement. It says, the only way to keep health is to eat what you don't want. Drink what you don't like and do what you'd rather not. So folks, <laughs> thanks for your attention very much. There's a reception somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, don't, really, uh, don't forget to fill out your forms to get CME credit and to register in and fill out your form on what you thought about the talk. We look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you. Well, Wilson, uh, could I ask one question? Uh, we're, we're involved, uh, trying to get more involved even in continuing medical education at Baylor. Uh, uh, do these meetings on a Saturday afternoon from 4 to 7, is that a good time for you folks? Would there be a more preferable time? No? Yes? No. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry about that.